Um, but now I am here to, with the distinct pleasure of welcoming our second keynote speaker to the stage, Dr. Nikki Trailer Knowles. She's an associate professor in marine biology and ecology at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, where she leads the Nadarian Immunity Laboratory. They're focused on conducting world-class discovery research on the innate immune system in corals. Their research focuses on critical processes that will help inform the restoration community on how to work with corals that will be better able to deal with all that keeps coming at them in the future. Nikki received her PhD from Boston University, go Terriers, in 19, 2012. And in addition, she is also the founder and director of Black Women in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Science, a nonprofit founded to help combat the isolation and abuse in STEM against black women. Please welcome Dr. Charles Nose to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here finally. I want to thank all the organizers so much for putting on this event. Um, and I also want to acknowledge what is happening on the west side of Florida right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just hoping we'll, we'll, we'll make it through. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of the work that my lab has been doing, um, really exploring the idea of echoimmunity, stem cells, and the interaction of microbes and the immune system in corals. All right, so bear with me, okay? Follow me here. <laughs> so I, I wanna take a moment to step back and, and think about how far human medicine has come, right? We have a lot of problems, I'm not arguing that, but we are no longer using cocaine for toothaches <laughs> or tapeworms, I hope you aren't anyway. Um, and um, certainly not using leeches if you have a cold, right? And this has all been possible, um, you know, as we go and we look then now of what we actually have, which is, you know, the human genome is being sequenced. How you can go and get your genome sequenced for like $200 and find all your relatives all over the world, right? There's targeted cancer therapies using nanotechnology, right, that's really pointed and specific to um, dealing with cancer and vaccines. No, no matter what you think about the COVID vaccine, um, it's pretty freaking amazing how quickly they were able to design and develop that. And all of these things have been possible because of cells. If we didn't have cell biology, if we didn't understand cell biology, we would not have any of this right? We would still be using tapeworms to lose weight. <laughs> so now coming into corals, corals are simple but complicated invertebrates, right? I like to think of it that way because on the surface, they seem so simple. But when we start looking deeper and deeper and deeper into them, into the cells, they are so freaking complicated, right? So it's an, the animal itself is an ecosystem, and then also it's a symbiosis within symbiosis within symbiosis. So there's also endosymbiosis within endosymbiosis. I mean, it's this really complicated web that we're really only just starting to understand. And this is where I think that we're really starting to, to break and understand this complexity is through understanding the cell biology of corals. Because corals are the functional unit of health and life. And I think we forget that sometimes. So I just like to remind that, that really within the coral health and being able to effectively restore reefs, we have to understand their cell biology so that we can make better informed choices and also be able to um, design better um, restoration strategies. So my lab's motivation is can we develop metrics for effectively measuring coral health? Because right now, how it works is that we're diving on a reef or snorkeling and we see, we see this. And then we know that the coral is sick. And by that point, as most of you know, it is just mitigation survival mode trying to get the coral to survive. 
And so we're really invested in trying to think about ways in which to um, use quick test, quick test systems um, on a more micro scale, so in including more cell bi biology, um, but also um, looking at the genetics of corals in a, in a different way, I think, than has been traditionally done. Um, and then lastly, really bringing in diverse perspectives and ideas, many of which are um, uh, um, motivated through medicine. So this is sort of just the overview of what my laboratory does. And the uh, circles are the, 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 the red circles uh, denote the areas that I'm gonna be talking about today. So including our work on the coral holobiome, um, stem cells, and immunocell biology. And I just want to acknowledge the students or former students that worked on this because they're really the ones that have driven this um, and have made this actually happen. So Grace Snyder, who's a current student in my laboratory, and Dr. Michael Conley, who's now at the Smithsonian doing his um, postdoc. So the major questions I want to talk about today. Uh, one, can immune cells be useful for understanding coral health? And just to orient you, I will have the species that we'll be using, and yes, that is a sea anemone, not a coral, but we use this as a model species um, to test out ideas and then apply it to corals. So I'll try to denote that when it, when it comes up. Um, how does lab-induced disruption of bacteria consortium affect coral health? And are stem cells a viable way forward for coral resiliency? Okay, so the coral immune system. I could go on and on about this. I could talk for, about, for hours about how amazing the coral immune system is. It's really diverse. It's really, um, every time you look at the genome, you look at um, um, transcriptome sequences, protein sequences, you discover something new every time. So there's so much that we don't know about it at this point. But there's also a lot that we do know, right? That they possess, um, they're able to deposit melanin, fluorescent protein pigmentation, they possess the ability to form chimeras or have allo recognition. Um, there's mucosal epithelia, which we know is um, involved in, in um, bacterial, um, antibacterial properties, immune cells, and then also all of these genes and pathways that um, we're still discovering their roles and, and trying to understand their function. Um, but to take a step back, coral cell culture has been so challenging. There's a reason that we aren't to the point of, of nan you know, using nanotechnology with corals. And that is because of their microbiome and their microbe community that they live with. So in this figure here, these look like coral cells. And actually, my lab thought they were coral cells for like a year. Turns out they're not. They're actually thastochytrids that are found within Biscayne Bay. The corals and the sea anemones take it up from the water. And when you put them into a cell culture, they just take over. And so this is a cautionary tale because many times we think that we are working on coral, but we're actually not. So um, it just, you know, as a reminder that, yeah, it is this microbial holobiont community. Um, and so one of the first things my lab had to do was just, we needed to figure out what are the limits of doing tissue culture with corals so that then we can apply this to testing other um, um, stressors. And so a former student of mine um, who's, who's now doing his PhD, he uh, um, tested over 175 cell cultures. It was a massive project um, in these two different uh, um, species. And what he found is that there was an average survival about 12 to 14 days, but that it really does hit a wall where the faster chytrids will take over after that. And there's also some variation of, of, of um, um, cultures that will last longer than that. But the thing was, is that we needed a strategy to actually start to separate out cell types. And the thing is, is that in, in medicine, they don't just culture a whole organ, right? They culture just a specific cell type from that organ. So we want to try to apply some of those techniques, but we needed a way in which to actually isolate those cells um, and, and then test those. So that's where my favorite technique comes in called fluorescence-activated cell sorting. 
This technique um, is used and has been used in medicine since about the 90s. Um, and what it is is you shoot a bunch of lasers into a cell. It can help you then define the cell granularity and the size. Um, and then you can also use fluorescent markers to um, be able to actually um, define the functional characteristics of the cell. So this is really exciting but also incredibly challenging with corals because as we know, they have tons of fluorescent proteins, right? That's, in medicine, that's where we got the fluorescent proteins are from nadarians. So we decided to harness this, right, and use this because they naturally have it to start to define and understand all the different cell types. So this is what it looks like before it's unsorted. You can see there's a ton of cells in here, right? Um, lots of different types, including the symbionts. But then what we can do is start to separate it out. And all these little dots represent cells. And then we can separate them based on size or fluorescence. And we get about 12 general cell populations. But then the question was, OK, we have these general populations that are just sorted and, and you know, put in different ways based on these general characteristics. But I wanted to know, where are the immune cells? And there's been a lot of, of uh, controversy around this. And in fact, even in the literature, saying that corals don't have immune cells. But they do. So I'm not going to go on and on about showing that. Um, but um, one of the main things was that we wanted to show that they do actually have immune cells. And so in one of our first papers, we were able to show that they have them um, and were able to show that they can engulf um, um, fluorescent beads and bacteria just like any immune cell would. Um, but in the back of my head, I'm still thinking of those thastrochytrids, and I was like, I don't know, we need to sequence this. We need to know for sure that this is coral. And so we were able to do single cell sequencing. You don't have to know what any of this is, just know that it is coral and it is all a bunch of cells, <laughs> okay? Um, and then I include this for the folks in the audience that like genes um, and gene expression, but this I'm highlighting here because this is a marker for a phagocytic cell, for an immune cell. So when I saw that, it was like, Hallelujah. You know, it has been five years that we've been trying to do this. And so now we can start to develop markers for the immune cells that we can just use directly to start to target them. So we're really excited about this breakthrough. Um, and this was all because of my student, Grace. So then, the, the, you know, I showed you all the background of like how we got there. And you're like, who the hell cares? But what I want you to understand is that the whole point of me doing any of this, I mean, there's the basic science, I think it's super cool, but it's also, I want to develop a marker that we can use, and one that isn't going to take, you know, months to years to actually get an answer. So we can run these samples really quickly, as long as we can get some live tissue, um, and we can run them and then understand what the immune system's doing. So, um, what we did as a test with this is we uh, um, looked at stony coral tissue loss disease, and we had a, a, a piece that was, had a lesion present, so you see the margin here, right, the margins through here, and then this is the area that's quote unquote healthy. I use quotes because we know that that's not actually healthy, but it looks visually healthy, right? And then we compared it to a control that was non-infected control, and then a coral that had recovered after a week. And what we saw was so interesting to me because we found that the healthy and the margin, both of them had this higher rate of phagocytosis, so meaning in it elevated immune response, compared to the controls or the recovered, where we saw that um, it was more attenuated. So indicating that we can actually use this on corals, even if they visually look healthy, we can start to get a foundational understanding of what are their health metrics. It's like a blood test, right? Now, there's a lot of work to do with this, and I'm not saying that it's easy, but I think this is really promising, and I'm really excited about it, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, so potentially, yes. 
So we really need to scale up on this. There's a lot of nuances because as you all know, with restoration, every coral is totally different, right? And acts totally different and it's the same at a cellular level. So we're trying to work on developing um, more of a generalized metric with this and be able to automate it better. Okay, so the next question of how does lab-induced disruption of bacteria consortium affect coral health? That's a lot, um, but what motivated this is that when we see these cell cultures, we're always seeing microbes take over. And so my thought was, is there a way that we can disentangle the two? And I thought, well, let's use antibiotics. And so my student, um, Mike, he was awarded a, a NSF EPSI award and able to go to Taiwan and do this work with um, our Taiwanese collaborators. And he was able to um, set up this experiment where we looked at the effects of heat stress, antibiotic exposure, and then the two stressors together, antibiotics and heat stress. And then we used transcriptomic sequencing of the coral and the symbiodenisiae to look at the gene expression, right? And then we also used 16S RNA sequencing to look at the bacteria composition. And so what I want you to pay attention to, if you've never seen a PC plot like this, don't worry. All I want you to notice is that the yellow, which is the antibiotics and heat stress, it's away from the rest of the groupings in the, in the coral. So there's this distinction with this stressor. Um, and that distinction is not as much present with the antibiotics um, or the heat. And then when we look at the algal symbiont and the bacteria, we see something totally different. And this totally surprised me, especially with the symbiont, where we see that there's actually this difference in breaking between, um, based on the antibiotics. And I was really surprised, especially, that the symbiont was affected by the antibiotics because traditionally, um, when you look at gene expression of, a, of the, of the um, algal symbiont, you don't see a lot of changes. So this was really interesting and I thought let's, you know, Mike decided to then look further into this. And what he saw, these are what we call differentially expressed genes. And this can be a metric of the reaction of the genome to a stressor. And so in yellow here, this is the antibiotics and heat stress. And we can see that both the symbiont and the coral are affected and responding a lot. But when we look at cladocopium to the symbiont, we see that um, they are less sensitive to heat, but more sensitive to these antibiotics. And that was really surprising. And then we see that corals are more sensitive to heat, not as surprising. So this was really fascinating to me and something that I think we need to be aware of and think about, that the symbiont is sensitive to they have an intimate relationship with bacteria, and I think that's something we need to explore more, especially about the coral health, because we know that the symbiont is so important to the health of the overall organism. This, and I know there's a lot on here, but um, what I want you to take home from this is just pay attention to the colors. So in the control and the heat, we see a lot more of the green, and that represents this endozycomonadinaceae, um, which is representative of a more healthy state. And I say healthy in, in quotes because it's a lot more complicated than that. But we can think that that's more of a stable state. The red represents um, um, a teromonodinaceae, and that's more representative of a disease state. And what we saw is that when we applied antibiotics, it shifted over to a more disease state. So that we saw that there was more um, of the red appearing, right, and, and being able to um, potentially take over or um, 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 be more present within those niches that, that were um, destroyed by the antibiotics. So again, showing, and we didn't see, the other piece too is that we didn't see that with the heat, and that was really surprising to us. I thought for sure we were going to see a huge shift in the heat, and we didn't. And so, at least in this case, we're seeing that heat alone doesn't seem to cause the disease state in this coral, and that actually what, we need, what needed to happen was that there was this disruption to the bacteria, 
and then with the heat, and we saw that there was this diseased, more diseased state happening. So I'm really awesome with computer graphics. So <laughs> I'm really good at that. <laughs> so just as a summary, control. You know, they're cool, they're happy. We add in some heat. Not really liking it, but they're hanging in there, right? Add some antibiotics, game over for symbiont and bacteria, not happy. Coral's okay. But then when we, oop, what did I do? There it is. But then when we add both, that's where we see that the whole system goes away. So I think this is a cautionary tale, and I wanted to tell this here because I know we're using a lot of antibiotics right now in corals. And while I know we need to, I think we also need to make sure we're monitoring it and being very careful because I think that there's an intimate relationship that we don't understand and we need to make sure that we do understand it. Okay, so the last piece. Um, are stem cells a viable way forward for coral resiliency? So this is um, some work that is actually, we've just started in the last couple of years and, and was really something though that we've been, I've been thinking about for a really long time, but we, it, it was a little sci-fi, so, so hang in there with me. So it all started as this crazy idea as a postdoc um, when I was doing my postdoc at, at um, Hopkins Marine Station, and I met um, Dr. Benjamin Rosenthal, who is by training an immunologist. And he was interested, his past work, he did work on pregnancy and um, you know, mouse models and all this stuff, malaria. Um, but when he came to Hopkins, he was really interested in learning about comparative immunology. And so I was like, have you heard of corals? You know, let's, let's talk. Um, and so we started talking about this and said, well, let's try to run all the different types of viable stains for cells that we use in immunology on corals and see if they work. And so that's what we did. This is the process of how we, we usually use airbrushing to disassociate the coral cells and then you get you know, all the cells. Um, and then we're able to use that flow cytometry to um, disassociate them um, or uh, identify the different cell types. This is a huge table, don't worry about what it says. I'm just showing it to, <laughs> showing it to prove that we've tested a lot of different uh, markers, but two of them were for stem cells. And we were really surprised that these worked because there had been a lot of discussion that corals maybe don't have stem cells, which I thought was really weird because they're able to regenerate. So there has to be some sort of cellular reprogramming that's occurring, and they have to have a population of cells in which, um, that are pluripotent. So we decided to follow this further. And so the idea was, what if we could do stem cell therapy to, for corals? Like, what if we could do that? Um, and so, you know, the idea being that you had a genotype that's maybe more thermally tolerant, and you uh, isolate those cells, enrich it for stem cell population, and then put them in the other genotype that's maybe less thermally tolerant, right? And, so, and then be able to monitor and watch them and see if we could actually then confer long-term thermal tolerance. And there's precedence for this in other organisms. So um, previously, Benjamin had worked on a, um, a colonial tunicate kit model, which um, it's at least colonial, but it is definitely not a coral. But um, you know, he was able to do this transplantation of different cells um, and found that they had this rejection and allo recognition, just like what we have in humans. And so this is the pipeline that we use, where basically we take um, the coral or sea anemone, we mash it up, put it through the flow cytometer, then we're able to get these different cell types, and then we want to sequence them, and we can then go back and develop markers while also working on doing transplantation assays. And so this is some preliminary data that um, um, Benjamin and his laboratory have um, 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 gotten. And what they saw is that they first started using a anemone model. And after two months of transplantation, um, they were able to see that there was actually growth of the cells. 
And so to orient you here, what they did is they transplanted 100,000 cells that were from a transgenic animal. So it's expressed this marker called M. cherry, and you can take out the cells, they're red, and you can transplant it into a wild type animal that doesn't have the red, so you can visually see it. And then you can monitor it for months and months at a time, and then you can actually quantify it. And so after two months, he was able to um, um, measure the expression of this marker called ALDH, and it's a marker for stem cells, and we saw that there was an increase um, within the transplanted cells, so indicating that there's actually proliferation that's occurring. And this is also the other thing is then, well, maybe they're just proliferating, but they're not actually changing. So then they were able to isolate those cells and look at them. This is what they look like when you transplant them. And I want you to notice that they just look kind of round. There's not much granularity to them. They're different sizes, but they're not very complex. And then over here what you see is that after two months, there's differentiation that occurs. So they're changing. And then we wanted to quantify this, so using machine learning um, to show that actually there is this differentiation that's occurring after two months after transplantation. So this is really, really exciting, but all of this was done in a sea anemone, and so we were like, we gotta apply this now to corals. And so what we did is basically take the same methods and now apply it over to corals, um, but what I wanna draw your attention to is, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong thing. This one. Is this right here. So that blob <laughs> that's in that little uh, square is fluorescence, it's autofluorescence. And we use fluorescent stains to identify these cells. So it was a huge challenge to figure out how can we differentiate just what is autofluorescence and what is truly a proliferating cell. Um, so, my student Grace, she tried a bunch of different markers, and we were able to use two different markers together to confirm um, and, and, and compare that these are actually um, consistent with stem cells. And we were able to then isolate out the stem cells. So again, they look very reminiscent of what we showed you in the sea anemone, where they just sort of look round and they don't have a lot of um, granularity or, or, or shape to them. And then what we did is set up this preliminary trial where we just, and this was just on one genotype, but we took, um, exposed them either no exposure to cells, exposure to cells that were ALDH negative, so potentially not stem cells, or exposing them to ALDH positive cells that are enriched, cells that are enriched for stem cells. And then we collected and tested them at week one and week two. And what we were looking for is to see, do we see an increase in stem cells? And so we would run it on the flow cytometer and then use um, microscopy and sequencing to, to characterize these. So all of this is to say that you don't have to understand any of this except to know that we saw this increase after two weeks in the ALDH positive cells. So indicating that there is replication that's occurring right, and that potentially we're able to do these transplantations with corals. Um, and so now we're starting to expand this out, look at genotypic differences, because there's going to be stem cell competition, there's going to be failures that definitely occur. But this was so promising. But again, I was like, are these thastachytrids that are just like replicating in the coral? Um, and so we needed to look at them visually, and we, th we thought that visually these do not look like the thastochytrids, um, and um, you know, they have this more um, 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 round um, appearance. And um, you know, the next thing is that we needed to sequence this. So again, we have a ton of work to do on this. And so um, we've started to and been able to finally get this data which again, this is something that my student had been working on for years. Um, and so this is just the, whoop, this is just the preliminary data, 
But what we see is that I want you to notice how there's these groupings on the ALDH negative. So this indicates that there's these different types of cells that are grouping. But if you look over here on the ALDH positive, there is, there's no grouping, and that's because they are a homogenous cell population. So this is indicative, and we're really excited because I, I think we have the stem cells. So, um, so stay tuned for, for the genes. We're working on analyzing this, and I hope that we'll be able to publish this quite soon. Um, so looking forward, or not, there we go. So, um, you know, where I'm really thinking about and, and excited about, um, and I hope that I've opened your eyes a little bit to this and you can think about how maybe testing different things, for, especially for immune response or even for stem cell transplantation um, could be very valuable, um, are the development of these live cell assays to disentangle the function and also be able to use it as an applied um, method for health um, and disease. The connection between immunity and, and stem cells and, and cellular reprogramming. There's a lot of potential in this. It's gonna be a lot of work, but there's a lot of potential. And I think it's something that we need to think about as a community as we're doing um, you know, this assisted evolution. This is another area that we really need to work on. And then lastly, um, this that within the stem cells, scaling up the differentiation, is gene editing possible? Do we even wanna go there? Um, and how to apply this in the field? Is this actually possible? Um, and so, you know, there's still a lot of questions and this is just in its infancy, but I'm really, really excited about it and I think, um, I hope you are too, because the potential's big. Lastly, um, I just wanna give a shout out to my nonprofit, BWEAMS, or Black Women in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Science. It's a mouthful, so we just call it BWEAMS. Um, I started this, I, I didn't intend to become a director of a nonprofit, um, but I was really tired of being alone. So I sent out a tweet and all these women responded and so I said, let's have a meeting. And so we, from there it took off. Um, so started in summer 2020, we have over 300 members now. Um, we have monthly virtual events and socials, which are all free for BWEAMS members. Um, and we're an official 501c3, so um, all donations are tax deductible. And really what we're focused on is creating community, um, training, and, and breaking the abusive cycle that has been occurring in STEM for black women. So, this is my last pitch. If you or someone you know identify as a black woman in um, ecology, evolution, or marine science, please reach out. Membership is free, and we, we have a good time. Lots of events. Last year, we did over 60 events. Um, and if you want to connect, talk more about immunity or corals, this is uh, where we're at. And I also want to thank my whole laboratory, former members and current, who are both um, Allison DeMurlis and Ben Young are both giving talks tomorrow, and I'm sorry, I don't know when, but it's tomorrow, so check out their stuff. Um, and I want to thank them, everybody for all of their help and time, and thank you for being here and listening to me geek out about coral cells and uh, my collaborators um, and funders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. It was really cool to geek out with you. Um, as a reminder to everyone here, we are live streaming and we are gonna take some priority questions from the viewers online. And so um, they're also just, I'm gonna kind of pause for a second because there's about a 30 second delay. So there might be some last minute questions that come in. Gotcha. But I will start with one that I think is fairly simple. Um, when you were talking about the um, heat stress and antibiotic stress yeah. work, the question came in, where are these antibiotics coming from? Um, so they, meaning what type? Well, they were saying like, is it in the gray water or is it that, I think maybe you're we talking about We were applying directly. antibiotics. This was a lab experiment. Mm -hmm. So I believe it was ampicillin and, and streptomycin, mm -hmm. a mix, yes. And then you were kind of alluding to using antibiotics as an intervention. And that is, again, something that we're directly applying to corals right. in studying right. coral tissue loss disease right. treatments. Right, right. Okay. 
Right. Um, okay, we have another question here. What is the biggest challenge in culturing coral immune cells? I think it would be an incredibly useful tool in coral ecotoxicology to look at coral immune response to chemical stressors. Absolutely. So I would say the, the biggest challenge, well, one of the biggest hurdles was just isolating them, right? So we've done that. And now I think what it is is just making sure that you have a happy environment for them. So they're used to being, you know, in a, a tissue environment, and now suddenly they're in this culture environment. So being able to come up with, and what we're working on is now creating an environment in which they can grow and maybe even um, replicate so that we can keep cultures for at least 14 days and if not longer. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so, so far, that's all that we have had come in online. So if there's any questions from people in the room, feel free to get in line at the microphone and we'll take those. And if I see any more come in online, I'll uh, jump to those also. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you, that was so awesome, thank you. Um, I just wonder if you could speak to the last part of your talk. As allies, what can we do to support foods? <laughs> Don't be racist. <laughs> Start there. How about that? <laughs> but I mean, um, in all in all seriousness, though, um, you know, I think being able to one examine um, examine how how you're approaching your lab, your research. Do you have a diverse team? Do you interact with diverse people? Um, are you just sort of in an echo chamber and? you know, not really actually interacting with your community. I think as a coral community, we're getting a lot better at it, but there's still a really long way to go. And so I think a lot of it is really self-reflection. Um, and then start doing the action, you know, um, and, and be willing to take a chance on some students that maybe aren't the traditional, you know, um, um, traditional student. And, um, you know, because I know for myself, I wouldn't be right here right now if someone hadn't taken a chance on me. So, yeah. And you can donate to Boeings. That's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions here in the room? Well, you know, I don't, I, I mean, I can, I can speculate all day, so I don't really know why, but I do know that we know that there are bacteria that associate with the phycosphere around, you know, the, the symbiont, and even within the symbiont, there are bacteria. So I think that there is a more intimate relationship than, than we know about. Um, what that relationship is, I don't know, um, but, I think it's something that, that is really interesting, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that it's also helping with, um, um, you know, the, the ability to fight different stressors. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Best I could give. Yeah, thanks. Um, there was a clarification that I'm still not 100% sure I'm clear on yeah. um, in, on the question on the antibiotics. So it says, oops, sorry, was referring to antibiotics occurring in urban wastewater, ask knock on impact. I'm hoping that's a typo. I don't know what that part means. I tried <laughs> to get clarification, but there's a bit of a delay. So, okay. um, but I think maybe wondering, like, are we seeing this reaction occurring in wild corals because there's uh, that, antibiotics in possible. the wastewater? That's very possible. I mean, I, I, again, this is speculation, but I think that the fact that we know when coral gets stressed, it bleaches, and then we're seeing the effects of the antibiotics on the um, symbiont, is an indication that maybe that's another piece of this that maybe we're missing. And so whether that's through you know, natural causes or not, or what's happening with water waste, you know, it's, it's, it's all possible. Well, we all know how to get a hold of you, Nikki. So if you have any additional questions from those people online, uh, feel free to shoot her an email. And I'll go ahead and see if we have um, time for one more question from the oh, oh, crowd. One more. All right, go right ahead. Hi, thanks, Nikki. That was really cool. Um, I'm really interested in your isolation of these 
stem cells. And I, I think what I've gathered from this is that you've only inoculated healthy corals with your potential stem cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how far away are you from testing this on diseased corals? And can we do something similar to what we're using with stem cell therapy in humans to, for example, try to um, help corals recover from certain coral loss? That's exactly where we're going with this. So um, we are still in the very uh, beginning phases of this because there is stem cell competition and allo recognition where you know it doesn't like non-self inside of it. So there's still a lot of testing that we're doing, but that is where we are heading. And I'm hoping that probably in the next year, we'll be able to start doing some of those preliminary tests. Yeah. We have another question here. Are you also working with virus? Uh, antibiotics are only effective with bacteria. Yeah. Nope. We, 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 we figured three parts of the <laughs> holobiome were <laughs> enough. But yeah, no, I mean, there's still obviously all the other components, um, and, and we haven't looked at those, but that's somebody could definitely do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, well, if anybody has, oh, are we getting another question? Oh. Nope, okay. Um, if we have any other questions for Nikki, hit her up uh, later uh, this week. And we really thank you all for your attention and thank for you your so amazing much. talk. Thank you.